Uh, welcome back. Yeah. So, uh, so this is the uh, first lecture, uh, lecture in the mathematical modules. Yeah, we're going to talk about the departure reasoning about computation via mathematics. Yeah, and in the same time, if you as uh, as before, like if you have any questions, yeah, I'll try to give some uh time in the middle to let you ask questions, but uh, the most uh, easy way to ask questions is through like a VVox. Yeah, and and I'll try to monitor that. And also you can send message to, to the TF, which are like co-host, they will answer you there. Okay, so let's get started. Yes, so in this module, uh, we'll talk about uh, mathematics and uh, computation. And there can be two directions to talk about uh, their relation. Yeah, the first could be how computation have uh, applications in mathematics. And in this direction, computation then is more like a tools for people to study mathematical problems. Yeah, but in the mini course, maybe we are slightly more interested in the other direction. We want to see how uh, mathematics can provide a good abstraction uh, for, for us to have some insights about uh, the essence of computation. Yes. And just to remind you a little bit from the uh, introductory lecture, like uh, if you're not familiar with math, it's totally okay. I try to reduce the number, the amount of equation as possible and try to feel uh, what's going on uh, in the underlying story. Okay, so maybe let's uh, start with uh, the computations in math, which although it's not the focus of the mini course, but uh, it would be nice to have a complete view. Yeah, so as uh, most people uh, have experienced before, like maybe in elementary school, we do lots of arithmetics, but the arithmetics actually in the hindsight is it, it actually just uh, doing computations, like doing addition, multiplications, etc. And maybe in high school, yeah, we then move on to trying to find the greatest uh, common divisors yeah, of like uh, two integers. Yeah, and the way we did that is exactly also using some computations or also known as Euclidean algorithms. Yeah, and for more advanced high school students, maybe now your teacher asks you to find the roots of some uh, quadratic uh, polynomials. Yeah, for those who haven't didn't experience that, actually, it's a blessing. Yeah, maybe it will. It is a nightmare for lots of uh, high school students. Yeah, and in college, maybe then you started to do some calculus, and calculus in hindsight also involve lots of calculations, applying lots of rules, etc. Yeah, so you can see that computations indeed play a like a very crucial uh, uh roles in uh, mathematics. Yeah, but the focus uh, of the, this lecture and the next will be how to study computations like using mathematics. Yeah, so as we see before, like uh, computations have lots of uh, intuitive notion, either from daily life in the technology or like uh, in the high, high school mathematics problems, arithmetic or calculus, etc. Yeah, but the, the way we're going to approach it is actually through an abstraction. Yeah, try to formalize or like abstract the computations yeah, we see in our daily life or in the math textbook into some abstract objects to study. So this will be an abstract approach. And in the next few slides, I'm going to make this more concrete and explain what do I mean by having an abstract formulation of computations through mathematics. Okay, so how do people math like a mathematically model, models like computation, or now I call it computational problems. Yeah, so there can be multiple types. Yeah, first it could be a decision type, meaning that I'm asking you a yes, no questions. For example, here I can ask you, or I'm giving you a number and ask whether it's a prime or not. It's a prime number or not, like 47 is a prime or not. And uh, yeah, it is, yeah. And it could also be a counting problem. For example, I give you a quadratic polynomials. Yeah, as we see before, if you don't see before, it's totally fine. I ask you how many roots it has. So it's like asking 
how many solutions of the input has. Yeah. And it can also be a search problem. It's like you want to find something. Yeah. For example, here, this is, uh, this is in mathematics called a graph. We have vertices, vertex. We have many vertices which are denoted by dot here. And we have edges connected them. Yeah, and we want to have some colors on the vertex vertices such that like the adjacent uh, vertex, meaning that they are connected by an edge, cannot have the same color. So this is known as a graph coloring problem. And this is a search problem. I formulate in a search problem way by asking you to find the coloring for me. Yeah. And finally, we can also have some kind of optimization problem. For example, we still have a graph here. And now I want you to like uh, cut the graph into half so that uh, the, the cut require the maximum number of uh, cut. Like you cut many, many edges as possible. So you are optimizing something. Yeah. So you probably already have a feeling uh, so far. Yeah, that uh, we try to talk about computation in a very, very abstract way. Yeah, but then, okay, this seems to be a little bit too abstract. How, how, how does this really relate to the original intuitive computational uh, notion we have in mind? So I'm going to convince you that uh, those abstract formulation indeed are quite relevant by the, using this example of graph coloring. Yeah, so just record like we have a graph, vertices and edge. We want to have colors on vertices so that adjacent vertex have different color. Yeah, so we have two nature applications related to our daily life. Yeah, the first one is uh, coloring a map. So imagine now you have a you have a map. Yeah, you are the you are the mayor of the city, and you want to make a new map. You have this uh, different uh, regions, and I mean it doesn't really make sense if you color all of them using the same color because this will confuse people. So you want to use different color, but uh, how can you do it? I mean, you can always just color them all different color, but if this becomes so large, it's, uh, it's not also not so visualizable. Yeah, so you kind of want to make sure you use small number of uh, color, but also make sure the neighboring regions having different colors. And this exactly can be phrased in the abstract setting of graph coloring problem. You can think of each region as a vertex and they are connected if they are neighboring with each other. So this is exactly the abstraction of this map. And if you can have a coloring for the abstract graph, you can just simply use it as the color for your map. And this just work. Yeah, by definition kind of, yeah. Namely, yeah, through this abstraction, you actually can rather than like uh, give you a map, yeah, and I like, try to find the coloring, you can map it a map into an, a graph and study the coloring problem there. Yeah, and you can even go beyond that. For example, when my roommate is doing some data analysis, he want to visualize it. He told me he facing this kind of like a coloring problem all the time. Yeah, but just now the graph maybe becomes much more complicated. And second, now I'm giving you a different example, like uh, most people probably already also know that it's called Sudoku, which is one of my favorite airplane uh, game. Yeah, so the rule is like uh, for each block, like in this case, a two by two, because I don't want to make a nine by nine one. Yeah, two by two block, you should fill in with a different uh, number one to four and each row and column as well. Yeah, and in the beginning, uh, it will give you some numbers and you fill the rest. And how does this relate to graph coloring? Yeah, you can think of uh, each vertex as something you want to color. And you now have like four color corresponding to one, two, three, four, like uh, red, blue, green, orange. Yeah, and uh, the constraints, for example, the constraint in a two by two block now becomes adding lots of edges here and the row becomes like those edges, making sure they cannot have the same color. And this is the, the rows constraints. Yeah, so now Sudoku basically becomes a problem that if I partially give you some color of this uh, Sudoku graph, how can you complete the coloring for me? Yeah, 
For example, this is a complete uh, solution for Sudoku, which is also corresponding to a, a coloring for the Sudoku graph. Yeah, so I hope uh, this slides, yeah, maybe it's very easy for lots of people who know graph coloring before, but for those who haven't seen this before, I hope this convinces you that an abstract approach by abstracting all the essence of uh, different computational problems to abstract problem uh, is helpful in the sense that now we can unify two seemingly very different problems using the same way and the same language. Yeah, and if you are interested in uh, the graph coloring, I also encourage you to go to the advanced section by our amazing TF, uh, Pralat. He's going to talk about, actually, if the graph is planar, in some sense, he will explain. Actually, full color is sufficient. And this also related to some deep uh, philosophical discussion about how mathematics can prove computations, uh, how computers can prove mathematics, sorry. Okay, so hope this already convinced you a little bit like a uh, mathematic can serve as an abstraction for studying uh, computation. And now I'm going to try to be more uh, concrete about what do I mean? So how to use mathematics as a language for study computation? Yeah, so in, for mathematician, in the beginning, they think of a computation or a computational problem as a function. In particular, it's a function that map natural numbers, which are like 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera, to natural numbers. And for computer science people, we are more maybe comfortable or like, a, like used to use like a, a function that map Boolean strings, meaning that it's like a, a strings of uh, symbols composed of zero and ones maps to Boolean strings. Yeah, so this might sound a little bit, okay, like uh, it's a little bit abstract. What do I really mean? Yeah, it just means that, yeah, for some inputs like a graph, we just encoded using like either Boolean binary strings or like using some, some integers, natural numbers to represent it. Yeah, and similarly, like for integer for like 47, when I ask you whether it's a prime, you can have a binary encoding or you can just use a natural number to represent it. Yeah, so it looks scary, but in hindsight, it's just a representation. Yeah, for the objects, for input and output you are thinking in mind. Yeah, but uh, by this kind of abstraction, now we can treat computational problems as a math problem to study. Okay, and uh, it turns out, also turns out that the way math people to formulate it using natural number is equivalent to the way computer science people to formulate it with a Boolean, uh, like binary strings. Okay, so maybe, yeah, because it is the first lecture, so I intend it to be slightly slower. If you have some immediate questions, please ask uh, on VBOX. Yeah, and uh, if no, then I'll proceed, but maybe I'll, I'll stop for 10 seconds. Okay, great. So now uh, we have, uh, so we just started to have a first step of formulating computational problem using mathematical language. Yeah, now what kind of uh, things we can ask using the language of mathematics? Yeah, how like a mathematical abstraction can help for computation? Yeah, and let me give you a historical, uh, like a journey through the very beginning of the study by a great mathematician uh, from the last uh, century. Yeah, it's called David Hubert. He asked this, uh, yeah, maybe someone no German should correct me. This, uh, and sh sh yeah, maybe I, I just, I, I, I tried to learn how to pronounce it last night, but I now forgot. But uh, basically it means the decision problem. Yeah, for those who know how to pronounce it, yeah, feel free to correct me, but I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, my, I don't know German. Yeah, but this means decision problem. And what the problem is stating is the following. It asks about whether there exists a mechanical procedure such that if I give you a logical expression or give you a mathematical problems and you tell me yes or no, according to whether it is true or not. 
Yeah. So you can think about this very similar to like a, a yes, no problem we mentioned uh, two slides away. Yeah, if I give you a prime number and assert whether 47 is a prime and your mechanical procedure should tell me yes or no. Yeah, so this uh, sometimes is also known as the Hilbert string. Yeah, it's like at that time you can imagine for mathematician in the last century. Yeah, they already have lots of uh, like a uh, impressive development, but in the meantime, they also have lots of unsolved mathematical conjectures and problem. Yeah, so one potential dream is like, uh, oh, what if all the mathematical problems actually can be solved routinely? If I tell you a mathematical problems, I just follow some finite number of steps and finite number of uh, rules. Yeah, and then I can know whether this mathematical uh, statement is true or not. Yeah, so this kind of dream at that time, actually most people, at least, at least for Hilbert as a great mathematician at that time, believe that's the case. They actually think there might be a mechanical procedure such that I give you a math problem, which I just insert into a mechanical procedure and you will tell me yes or no. Yeah, but at that time it's still a dream and it's even not very cleanly formulated what does mechanical procedures mean. Yeah, and how does this relate to computation? Yeah, you can think of uh, this question actually is a very computational question. It is asking that if I give you a mathematical problems, can you like do some computations and then tell me the validity of this mathematical problem? So in hindsight, this is a mathematical problem. It's like uh, asking about the computability uh, of something. Yeah, but you can also notice that, yeah, Hilbert's questions or Hilbert's dream for now is still a little bit vague in the sense that he didn't properly define what does he, what did he mean by mechanical procedures? So now let's try to dive into it and try to think about what do people really mean about uh, mechanical procedure. And in the more uh, modern term, actually this is known as a fancy name called algorithm, which people might saw it everywhere now in the media. Yeah, so how, how to mathematically like a model, what do we mean by an algorithm or a mathematical procedure? So in the previous century, you can think of it as a century of logician. Yeah, so lots of the attempts in the beginning, maybe it's trying to say, oh, yeah, we are doing logical reasoning. Yeah, so maybe the mechanical procedures means that we can, we can prove, uh, we, can, we can proceed by certain logical rules. And uh, there are lots of uh, different logical systems, yeah, can, can do certain level of uh, computation, similarly it's like doing some computations. But there's also a caveat in the sense that, yeah, we are still human beings, yeah, or like a logical reasoning, although it's very natural to us, but it also not the only thing we can do. Yeah, it seems that uh, human capability or at least the intuitive notion of mechanical procedure should be beyond just the logical reasoning, but how can we capture and model that mathematically? Yeah, so how can, like uh, so human seems to go beyond logical system and how can we capture this? So the second attempt, uh, which is to me is a very beautiful attempt is trying to think about, okay, mathematician seems to be the one who, who do the most uh, mechanical procedure who seems to do lots of uh, this kind of work. Maybe then a good attempt is trying to like have a mathematical model for mathematician themselves. And uh, this is exactly uh, like uh, what Turing basically did in his uh, very, very famous Turing machine, which I'll explain in the ne next slides. But now it's like uh, Turing used this Turing machine. Yeah, try to capture mechanical procedure much better like uh, than logical systems so that we can aim to answer Hubert's questions or Hubert's um, dream. Okay. So the, what is Turing machine? Yeah, so as I promised in the previous slides, you can think of Turing machine as an analogy to a mathematician doing calculation. So we can try to make this uh, analogies more elaborative. 
So you can think of what mathematician do is like, oh, they have a bunch of papers. Yeah, they can write. And in Turing's formulation of Turing machine, it's like a, the Turing machine will have a, a lot of tape. It can write things on the tape. Yeah, and mathematician write and read on the papers. The Turing machine similarly can also write and read on the tape. Yeah. And for mathematician, it has a state of its mind. Yeah, it's like, uh, oh, in the beginning, maybe it's initially it received the input and in the middle, maybe, oh, it's like almost come up. And finally, when he proved a theory, he was at the end state. So it's like the state, the mind of the mathematician changing. And similarly, to remodel this as the state of the machine, like a, like a uh, denoting like a, what's the current uh, stage of a Turing machine in the computation. And finally, a crucial point here is also like a mathematician is finite. Yeah, the brain size is finite. So the Turing machine is also finite in the sense that the number of states and number of symbols can be used are all finite. Okay, so this seems to be a very high level discussion. And uh, maybe now you have some feeling about the analogy between Turing machine and mathematician. But uh, maybe let me still use a very quick example to let those who haven't seen Turing machine before to have a feeling about what exactly Turing machine is. Yeah, and this might look scary, but uh, actually I try to make it as friendly as possible and you don't need to try to understand all the details. Instead, I encourage you just to have a feeling of uh, like uh, what's going on. Yeah, just uh, have a feeling is fine. Yeah, so now I'm here, I'm giving an example of uh, adding a binary integer 101, which is five, to 111, which is representing uh, seven. I want to use this Turing machine to explain how Turing machine do addition. Yeah, so what Turing machine did is like, uh, it will read some symbols, and according to its state, he will read something like here's A1, and then move and write things. Yeah, and then it will change the state. For example, now change to Q1, so he will read another rule, and move accordingly and so on and so on. Yeah, for example, now when you are doing addition, you might have some carry yeah, of the current digit. So the state change to a carry state. Yeah, and change accordingly, et cetera. Yes. So you can see that indeed, this looks quite mechanical. So kind of capture what uh, uh, Huber is asking. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> This actually turns out also be very powerful uh, in the next few slides. Yeah, so we can see that, okay, now our Turing machine has come to the end state. Yeah, like, uh, like uh, indicating that, okay, I finished the calculation. And the final result when we read out from right to left, this is exactly 12, which is five plus seven. Yeah, so I, I hope this animation let you have a feeling of uh, what's going on in Turing machine rather than give you a formal mathematical definition. So everything has a formal mathematical definition. If you are interested in, you can take a look at the reference. Okay, and I also want to uh, tell you, yeah, this should be the last time you see how a Turing machine work. Yeah, at least I, I originally thought I'll, I'll see Turing machine for the last time five years ago or something, but turns out for this mini course, I prepare it again. But uh, usually in your life, or the life of a theoretical computer scientist, you don't really need to dig into the dirty details of Turing machines. And in fact, you can actually feel free to think of Turing machine as your favorite computer, uh, like a programming language. Yeah, and if you don't know any programming language is fine, you can think of Turing machine as something like uh, you write down some, uh, like a SOP, like standard operating pr procedure, et cetera. So in summary, yeah, Turing machine, yeah, in, in our narrative, yeah, it is a generalization of the notion of logical system, try to make it more intuitive and closer to how human is thinking and aims to ca capture all the possible mechanical procedures. And uh, in particular, this gives us a ground, yeah, for, that, for us to be able to answer Hubert's decision problem or Hubert's dream. Yeah, because Hubert was asking, like, uh, is there any mechanical procedure such as give you a logical or mathematical statements? You output yes, yes and no according to the, the correctness. Yeah, so uh, 
if you uh, mathematically or philosophically or physically believe Turing machine capture the mechanical procedures, then you can answer this uh, Huber's questions because now you can replace the mechanical procedure with Turing machine. But of course, this, this step uh, is like a, it's more like a belief or more like a physical law or more like a postulate. Or in a CS term, it is called church Turing thesis. It's like we hypothesize a Turing machine being able to realize any effective uh, calcul calculables like a computational model. Yeah, so that uh, we can use it as uh, like a first steps to, to answer like a Huber's uh, decision problem. Okay, and for those who might uh, know more, like actually Turing machine is not alone. There are also some equivalent uh, computational model like lambda calculus. I just put it here in case people know it and want to ask questions, but I intended not to like uh, digress to that. The point uh, here is more about like uh, how like uh, people hypothesize Turing machine as a, as a mathematical definitions of mechanical procedure. Yeah. And in the lecture 1C, we will talk a little bit about uh, more on the philosophy of like uh, why people, people do this and try to justify this or even try to challenge that. Yeah. But, uh, but in summary, yeah, so far, yeah, it's like before we try to answer uh, uh, Hilbert's ring, Hilbert's decision problem, yeah, we use this uh, church Turing thesis to postulate Turing machine is equivalent to algorithm, is equivalent to mechanical procedures. Yeah, and so that, yeah, we really need to set off, yeah, before we answer the questions. And this is like the, the first things we need to assume before we can really move on. Okay. So maybe now is also a good time for me to take a look at the, the, the online Q&A. So if you have some immediate question, feel free to uh, put questions there. And you can also vote, like uh, upvote the question there so I can see them down here. Oh, someone asked about the quantum algorithm. Yeah, so, so here at least like in the church Turing thesis formulation, yeah, it's kind of like a partial, like it unified all the possible algorithm in the physical reality, including quantum algorithm if less realizable. But uh, before really trying to seriously answer that we need to uh, have a more solid introduction to content. So maybe I'll postpone it for a little bit, but uh, thanks for raising that question. Okay, yeah, that's a good, great question. Someone asked, has the uh, church rings is this even proven or disproven? So actually my re reply to this is actually, this is not something about uh, proof of not being proof. Yeah, so this maybe is a little bit surprising in the sense that maybe you think of mathematics about proving something. But in fact, in the very bottom of mathematics, people still need to assume or postulate something. Yes, for example, people might heard of like, uh, like axioms in mathematics. Yeah, like uh, you really need to first assume some of the axioms are correct. Yeah, so that you can move on. Yeah, so church Turing thesis actually is similar to, actually it is of the same role as those mathematical axioms. It's like uh, you first assume it is a case so you can build up the whole theory on it. And if you don't believe it, it's fine. You can create your another theory. Yeah, so that's why I say, yeah, there's, it's not about like proof of uh, disproof. It's more about belief or you don't believe. Yeah, but this is a great uh, question and clarify a lot. And what motivates Hilbert's? Yeah, I guess it's like, a, yeah, this probably is joking. Yeah, but probably mathematical, mathematician was tired at that time. Yeah, so many unsolved problems 
they 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 feel like they can solve it, but they don't have time. Yeah, and uh, maybe they really want to have a more effective and like uh, efficient way to solve it. Yeah, but this is joking. Yeah. Oh, okay. How Turing machine influenced by lambda calculus? Maybe I'll, I'll postpone to uh, the philosophical lecture. Yeah, but uh, thanks for suggesting this. Yeah. Yeah, and also as well as the uh, pan computationalism. Yeah, we will talk about it that. And the strong Turing system will also mention. Maybe oh, it will be mentioned tomorrow in the next lectures. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So maybe I'll take the other question later. But uh, thanks all of you for the yeah good questions. Yeah, it helped clarify a lot. And now maybe I'll move on. Yeah. And in the meantime, if you have urgent clarification questions, please feel free also uh, Zoom chat message the the other co-host. They are very friendly to help. Okay. Okay, now uh, we are oh, sorry, I should stop here so you can scan the QR code. <laughs> yeah, anyway, yeah. So now uh, after we, we assume, yeah, or like uh, we believe Turing machine captures mechanical procedures. Yeah, now we are kind of able to answer like a Hilbert string or Hilbert's uh, decision problem. Yeah, and uh, actually, yeah, yeah, for those who still own uh, VVox, I actually want you to uh, to have a vote, yeah, on like what you believe, yeah, like or what you guess, yeah, like on the answer to this uh, decision problem. Yeah, if you see this, uh, the result before, please uh, just click you have seen this before. Yeah, so that uh, we can have a more, like uh, we can see the results, uh, yeah, in an unbiased way. Yeah, I'm personally also very curious on this, yeah. And maybe to bias people a little bit, yeah, as I mentioned before, actually in the beginning when Huber uh, proposed these questions, these problems, uh, historically, like uh, people say, Huber's actually in the beginning believe the answer should be positive. Okay, maybe I'll give uh, 10 more seconds for people to vote and then I'll show the results. Also, I heard someone is uh, is uh, not muted. If you if it were you, mm, please uh, mute yourself. Thank you. Okay, so maybe let me show the result now. Yeah. So we can see, uh, yeah, some pe some amount of people have seen this before. Yeah, and for those who haven't seen it before, actually, yeah, it's quite even and maybe positive is slightly more than negative. Yeah, I'll keep this going. Yeah, but I'll also announce the result and explain, yeah, its consequences and explain the proof to you. So it turns out that uh, the, the answer actually is negative, meaning that actually, yeah, people can mathematical proof that if you believe Turing machine capture mechanical procedures, then you cannot have uh, mechanical procedures that uh, help you solve all the mathematical problems. Yeah, and historically, yeah, this can be viewed as the uh, sequence of a uh, series, yeah, cultivated by the uncomputable series proved by Turing and Church. Uh, roughly at the same time. But uh, let me uh, illustrate a little bit because this might look uh, complicated. Yeah, so the first uh, uh, step of trying to answer these questions, yeah, in a way I like to view it, is uh, it's called Goodell's incompleteness theory, which is one of the uh, greatest uh, like uh, achievement in the mathematics world last century, in my opinion, yeah. It is actually talking about logical system rather than Turing machine. So logical system is something like uh, we mentioned as an attempt one to model mechanical procedure. Yeah. And what Goodell did is like uh, he showed that for any powerful enough logical system, and let's denote it as S, you can always uh, find some logical claim. Like uh, you can state this logical claim in the this original logical system, but 
this logical system actually cannot prove whether this claim is like a yes or no. Yeah, so uh, here I just gave an informal statement. It's fine if you don't fully uh, like uh, understand it. Actually, in the in the later amazing advanced section by Rayo, yeah, he will explain it, and I'll provide the provide the, his his time later. Yeah, but this uh, Gadel's incomplete theory highly inspired and influenced the next uh, result that truly like a uh, like a uh, solve the Hubert stream, which is the uncomputability series. Yeah, and and proof by Church and Turing kind of at the same time is a historical complex story, but I, I won't digress there. But what they really did is the following. They can show that there is six uh, problems, computational problem, which is later for Turing's case is known as the holding problem. And it showed that there's no mathematical, uh, no mechanical procedure or equivalently no Turing machine can solve it. Namely, yeah, in other words, it's like uh, Turing identify a mathematical problems called holding problem, which we will explain next slides, and show that no Turing machine can solve this mathematical problem. And hence, this like uh, give a negative answer to Hubert's dream, because Hubert uh, was hoping that there is six a Turing machine such that if he give you any mathematical problems, you can give you any uh, answer like uh, true for you. Okay, so I know this size might be a little bit overwhelming for people who are not familiar with mathematical theory, so it's totally fine. And if you are interested in more details, you can go to reference or advanced section. Yeah, but for now, maybe let's uh, take a small step back try to think about like, uh, okay, so now we have a negative answer to Hubert's problems. And we saw this uh, great Goddell's incomplete theory and the uncomputability series. What do this theory really teach us? So first, as the statement says, they are say, oh, there is like some uncomputable problems, especially like a uh, whole team problem is uh, uncomputable. Although I haven't defined what it means, but uh, I'll, mentioned in the in the moment but in fact yeah what really happened in the world is like uh, the number of inc uncomputable problems actually is much more than the computable problems so what do i really mean is like uh, most problem in real world actually is uncomputable there are very very few problems on are computable but uh, at least somehow two mathematicians previously what they encounter, what they can formulate are uh, all those uh, computable problems so that they can really solve it. Yeah, not until Turing realized, oh, there is six some nature problem like holding problems is uncomputable. Yeah, but actually beyond holding problem, most of the problems, most of the computational problems, they are uncomputable in the sense that there cannot be a Turing machine that solves this problem. And uh, the, the even more like uh, stronger things or like a uh, more philosophical things is like, uh, uh, actually all these series, if you look in the proof, actually they are all suggesting that once you can formalize your computational model, either a logical system or your Turing machine, then you will have a limit there will be something that you cannot prove. And philosophically, I also yeah, want to like, uh, like show this code again, or I mentioned earlier, this is also like suggesting that as a finite human, this is actually not surprising in a sense, if we, everything is finite, then we definitely have some, something ignorance and the ignorance is infinite, yeah. But so this is also where the interesting things get started because although the computer pro computable problem is so small, most of the problems are uncomputable, but somehow what we, all we encounter are computable. Yeah, so this is suggesting that there are something, maybe some interesting thing going on. And we will talk more about this maybe in the philosophical lecture. Okay, so after seeing the negative answer to Hubert's uh, decision problem, Maybe some people will say, okay, 
yeah, is this the, the end of the theory of computation? Yeah, yeah, since the answer is negative, maybe there's no hope. Yeah, yeah, should, should we do other things? Yeah, but actually, this is actually the beginning of a new era, as we can see uh, from, from now, like in retrospect. In particular, the, the invention or the definition of Turing machine has inspired mathematically the theory of computing. And philosophically, it also in, in, like encouraged people to think about the validity of church Turing thesis. Like, uh, does Turing machine really capture the intuitive notion of mechanical procedures? And engineering or technologically, it also inspired the digital computers so that we can use Zoom now, yeah, to like uh, communicate like worldwide in the like uh, instantaneous fashion. And it also inspired other fields, including like the biology and physics. We are going to talk uh, in the other modules. Yeah, so I would say like although Turing machine in the beginning, yeah, seems to be some weird abstract mathematical notion trying to answer this uh, great mathematician dreams. Yeah, but it turns out that it has uh, like sparkling and inspired lots of uh, other areas and it becomes uh, important uh, things nowadays. So the important things, maybe it's not about Turing machine itself, like it's very definition, but it is about the concept of like uh, trying to formulate and having a mathematical definition of how do we mean by computation. It is the very first try in the concrete definition of it so that we can now have uh, so much uh, progress afterward. Okay, so before uh, I end and uh, summarize uh, this lecture, I also, I still want to give uh, some juicy part yeah, on the technical sites. Yeah, in particular, we are going to have a glimpse into the proof. Yeah, but also as I promised, uh, for those who are not very familiar with uh, math mathematical background, it's totally fine. Yeah, for the next few minutes, you can also feel like you are just watching a, a movie or something. Yes, yeah. So now in the next five minutes, actually just five minutes enough, I'm going to prove the uncomputability theorem to you which states that the whole thing problem cannot be computed by any Turing machine. Yeah, so first I need to tell you what is the whole thing problem. It's actually very simple. Yeah, the problem has input and output and the input is just a Turing machine, the description of a Turing machine. You can think of it as the code of a program and the input of the Turing machine. And the output is simply about whether when this input to machine running on this input of the two machine, uh, well, like a stop at some point. Yeah. And in the two machine language, it just means that whether it goes to the state Q end. <clears throat> okay, so you might, might feel like, okay, this sounds a little bit observed, like a white two machine might not hold. Let me exactly give you an example. For example, this is a code writing C, if you know this language. Like uh, if I put a one in a while, it will never stop. So this is like a, some example of a Turing machine that won't stop. And if you don't know C, it's fine. Yeah, imagine, yeah, you have a hedgehog running on the wheel, like never ended. This is like a Turing machine that will never stop. So it's on hold. Oh, although it stopped, you didn't see anything. Okay. Okay, so now uh, you know the definition of whole, uh, holding problem. I'm going to convince you with a very quick proof sketch that there cannot be any Turing machine solve this holding problem. Okay, and the way we prove it is by proof of contradiction. So we first assume, okay, actually there exists a Turing machine solve the holding problem, H. Okay, and then we want to derive some contradiction and we derive the contradiction use three steps. So first, yeah, we try to enumerate all the Turing machine in the y axis, and we enumerate all the possible inputs in the x axis. And second, we use this h from our assumption, yeah, which solves the whole thing problem to help us compute the entry of a table, which means that for an ij entry, yeah, we use this h to help us compute 
Turing machine I evaluated on uh, input J. Yeah, and note that we really need this assumption to do these uh, things because uh, this computation might not hold. Yeah, in particular, we defined uh, this table. If the I evaluate on J is, uh, is won't, won't stop, won't, won't hold, it actually means that uh, it is zero. Yeah, so we need this assumption for us to finish this table. Okay. And the third step is also quite simple. We designed another Turing machine T, yeah, using like uh, what we have done in the first two steps and the flip the diagonal of the table. So this is the original diagonal of the table, which you can be you can fill it with the assumption of this uh, H. You can flip it. Yeah. So now we have a, we have a Turing machine T that do this job for us. And by the assumption of a holding problem can be solved by a Turing machine. Yeah, this is completely doable. Okay. And it turns out that actually this is basically the end of the proof. Yeah. By these three steps, we actually already yield a contradiction. And the contradiction is about the existence of this Turing machine, capital T. Yeah, because if this T is a Turing machine, it means that it definitely appear in one of the Turing machine we enumerate in the first steps. Yeah, and let's say, yeah, just for convenience of this presentation, we say this Turing machine is number five here, yeah because it must appear somewhere. Let's just uh, give it a more convenient name. Yeah, I, I claim that we can already derive a contradiction in the following way. Yeah, suppose uh, like a five, the fifth Turing machine evaluate on the fifth uh, input is one. Yeah, if you go through the reasoning of uh, steps two and step three, it actually will tell you uh, five evaluate on five is zero, which is weird. I mean because I assume it is one, but by the definition of a uh, Turing machine T, yeah, in the uh, in, uh, step two, step one, you are giving a different answer. And similarly, if you assume five evaluate on five is zero, you run through the same logical arguments again, it will tell you five evaluate on five is one. Yeah. So what does this really say? It says that if you assume H, you can construct a Turing machine T, such that actually some part of the inputs, uh, something is undefined. Yeah, it cannot be either, cannot be zero or one. And this is absurd. This is uh, by definition incorrect. So we reach a contradiction. And this is contradiction, which implies that the assumption is wrong. Namely, there shouldn't be a Turing machine solve the whole thing problem. Okay, so I, I, I hope like uh, this gives you a feeling and it's totally fine for you to understand detail. When I first see this uh, theory, it also took me a while, but at least I hope this gives you an overview. In particular, let me summarize the three important steps. Yeah, or like three important ingredients in the proof, which we will elaborate in the uh, philosophical lecture. The first one is the ability to enumerate all the two machines so that you can actually write it down, like uh, looking as like uh, filling up a table. And the second is like, uh, you need to have something called a universal two machine so that you can simulate like a uh, two machine I evaluate on input J. This will also be elaborated later, yeah, in the, the third lecture. And the third important ingredient is what you see about the flipping diagonal of the table. It's called diagonalization, which is a very beautiful mathematical trick. Yeah, so it's like all just all these three simple ideas, then you can prove holding problem is uncomputable. Yeah, but I also encourage you to think about it. Yeah, if one of the things is not, not, not true, or like if you adjust the definition or something a little bit, then maybe you, you will have a different story. Yeah, but we can do it uh, later in the philosophical discussion. But at this moment, yeah, I encourage you, if you are interested, you can find some reference I listed and see the whole proof on your own and try to figure out the detail on your hands. And as a bonus for those who have seen like a holding problem before, but uh, might not see more than beyond that, there's actually much more problems that are uncomputable. 
And they are all like a, can be summarized in this uh, Rice theorem, which states that if some computational problem is semantic in the sense that it only de depends on the description of the functions. For example, uh, if the function is a uh, non-zero, yeah, because the input of the, the, the function is also a function. Yeah, then it is, uh, this is un uncomputable. Okay, so I I am not intended to 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 dive into a detail, but uh, the point here is just that there are much more computable uncomputable problems, and many of them actually are quite intuitive, in Rice theory. And if you are interested in this, I'm happy to answer it uh, in later Q and A or in the coffee chat. Yes. So a quick summary. Yeah, like in this uh, lecture, we see how people model mechanical procedures or mechanical process through theory machines. Yeah, and we use math as a language to help us to start the study of computation in an abstract way. Yeah, and we talk about the Hubert's problem and show that it actually is a negative answer. And we also talk about Turing machine as the beginning of a new era of uh, computations. Yeah. And here are some food for soul questions for you. Yeah, you can think about like uh, basically what you have learned, recall a little bit what you have learned today and what's the new things, what's the surprising things. And for those who are familiar with materials, I also encourage you to think about if uh, you or me, how would you talk about this in a different way and how would you explain this to your families and friends? Finally, yeah, let me quickly mention like the next lecture is uh, tomorrow, uh, 10 a.m. Eastern time. You can check your check a Google Calendar or course website to see what's the corresponding time in your time zone. And we our guest uh, lecture uh, is right after that. And we also have two amazing advanced sections by Rayo and uh, Pralad. Yeah, Rayo's sections is right after, uh, maybe two hours after Lee Jia's uh, guest talk. And Pralad's uh, lecture is one hour before the lecture on Wednesday. Great, so probably I'll end the slides with here, although I have a reference slide later, but uh, I'll put it on the website anyway. But uh, thanks for your like uh, attention and I'll start to uh, take some questions. Yeah, thank you all. Also, uh, since I'm not constantly checking the chat, if uh, any TF uh, teaching staff, you feel, feel like uh, there are some urgent questions to respond, you can also just chime in, yeah, and uh, directly open your mic and talk. Yeah, feel free to do that. Oh, someone said reference size, sure. Ah, okay, okay. Someone ah. asked, uh, hmm? oh, anyone say something? Okay, I saw on the Q&A, someone asked about, uh, it's actually not that obvious. Yeah, so someone asked, uh, uh, how do we know that there are more questions that are uncomputable than computable? Yeah, so, this is a good question, yeah. And uh, I'm not sure mathematical backgrounds, but uh, maybe let me make an analogy, yeah. And the reasoning actually is exactly the same, yeah. So if you know um, <clears throat> rational number and real number, yeah, rational number are something that when you write down the dig uh, write down the expression, it can write down as some integer divided by another integer. Yeah, and uh, real number is just uh, something like uh, you can you can keep writing down all its digit. Yeah, it's, for example, like uh, the pi, the 3.14 something. Yeah, it is a real number. And uh, actually we can, people can show that the number of real number is much, much, much more than rational number. Namely, if you, I mean, most of the real number actually is not rational. And uh, you can do this by some counting arguments. Yeah, or 
in real, I mean, in the, the first way people do it actually is through a diagonal process we do before. Yeah, and you can, through those kind of argument, you can feel that you can see like a why real number is much more than rational number. And uh, you can think about uh, Turing machine as just rational numbers. Yeah, because they have finite descriptions. So kind of one Turing machine corresponding to a rational number. A rational number can describe a Turing machine. But uh, computational problems is more like a real number. Yeah. Okay, maybe this is an intuitive way to explain that. Ah, oh, okay. Someone asked about, uh, yeah, this is also related. Yeah, like why the number of Turing machines is countable. Countable is a mathematical term, meaning that you can kind of enumerate it. And the reason is that because the description of Turing machine is finite. So if you remember, like when we make an analogy between mathematicians and Turing machine, we say that, oh, mathematician is a finite being. So Turing machine is also finite. So due to the finiteness, this is exactly why you can enumerate it. Yeah, and this is a great question. Yeah, this is also something maybe we will uh, we'll talk about in a philosophical lecture. Ah, another great uh, clarification question, like uh, are the logical system Turing complete? Yeah, so actually, yeah, I cheated a little bit. Indeed, some logical system are Turing complete. And the reason why I still wouldn't call it like the real attempt, like a attempt to or try to separate the two, is like uh, those things that are, are too complicated. Yeah, although mathematically they are equivalent, but intuitively it doesn't really capture yeah, what we think mechanical procedure is. Because this also boils down to the previous questions on like, uh, like church Turing thesis or like why we believe Turing machine capture mechanical procedures. Yeah, when we want to form this kind of uh, belief in the very bottom of mathematics, yeah, we want to have some intuition to support it. And uh, although there are indeed some logical systems mathematically equivalent to Turing machine, but to define it and to understand it actually is not very intuitive to normal people. Yeah, so that's why I kind of like put it in the term one and don't really call it like uh, the, the, the final attempt people made. Okay. Uh, I see there are lots of uh, other questions, but uh, they are less good. Mm -hmm. oh. Oh, someone asked about what's the definition of a computational problem? Yes, so the definition of a computational problem, oops. Basically, uh, is like what I mentioned here. Yeah, we're just thinking of mathematically, a computational problem now is just a mapping either from like a natural number to natural number or from Boolean string to Boolean string. Yeah, so any function like uh, doing this is called a uh, computational problem. Although it might not may really like a uh, uh, corresponding to something happen in real life. Yeah, but uh, is more on the other way. So like something in real life looks like a computational problem. Uh, most of the time you can phrase it in terms of uh, a function mapping like uh, natural number to natural number or Boolean string to Boolean strings. Oh, some, someone asked about my feeling on finitism. This is maybe a little bit philosophical. Let's uh, postpone these questions to the third lecture maybe. Okay. So yeah, I guess because uh, it's almost 12. Yeah, I, I don't want to keep uh, people here for so long. So maybe let's uh, officially end the lecture now.